Good evening, and welcome to another of our series of Making It Plain. In this case, a very special edition, a town hall for the dedicated people who work in aging services. My name is Reed Tuxen. I am a physician, and I serve as the moderator uh, for tonight's panel. I'm very excited uh, to present uh, our guests to you. But in particular, I'm very pleased that I represent the Black Coalition Against COVID, a unique uh, coalition of individuals that is comprised in part by our four historically black medical schools, Howard University, Morehouse, uh, Meharry, and the Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science in California, along with the National Medical Association and the National Black Nurses Association. We also have as partners, the National Urban League and the people who are bringing your program to you tonight technically is blackdoctor.org, our social media and internet and digital health partner. We are especially pleased to have this program tonight because we recognize and accept our professional responsibility to provide trustworthy advice and counsel to our society. And there can be no more important audience to us than the incredibly important people who protect the valuable lives of our agent. If you want to understand, we have always learned the character of a society. It is how we treat our people at the end of life and in aging. And so we are really, really excited to honor you, uh, the people who serve in so many variety of ways, in so many variety of settings, uh, our elderly citizens. COVID, ten, uh, COVID has been a devastating uh, uh, pandemic for all of us but none so more so than those who live and work in aging services communities and other older people who are served by aging services organizations. Now we have three vaccines to protect against severe COVID, but it looks like the majority of staff, for example, in nursing homes and assisted living who have been offered the vaccine are not yet ready to say yes. And so we wanna talk about those issues tonight and give you the information that you need to make personally appropriate choices. During this town hall, you can expect us to provide you with the latest scientifically accurate and trustworthy information that you need to know about the COVID pandemic and the steps that you can take to protect yourself, your families, your communities, and the people you serve every day. The people you'll hear from during this town hall are like you, doubling down on their jobs to get us through this pandemic and over to the other side. They are so deep in it that tonight's discussion will be up to the minute even covering the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, that has so recently been introduced into our society. In preparation for the show, we've solicited questions from you and others from the provider communities across the country. And our presentations tonight will be based on responding to your questions. Of course, we will also have a dedicated time after our presentations to answer any questions in the chat that we have not previously or adequately addressed. And so please feel free to indicate in the chat the questions that you want answered. And hopefully though, through our previous solicitation before this program, we hope that we've gotten most of the things that are on your minds. We know that if you are armed with the facts, you'll be able to make the best decisions about vaccines and about protecting your health and the health of those you love, as well as the older people you care for. I want to add that no speaker tonight is being paid to talk with you on any of the panels you're about to hear. No one here is endorsing any products but we are fortunate to have a generous educational grant from the Centene Corporation, and we appreciate their grant that helps us to put this program on. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Katie Sloan, who many of you know, most of you know, president and CEO of Leading Age, and who serves as the executive director of the Global Aging Network. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here tonight with you, Dr. Tuxin, the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, and all of you to address concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine among the vital and dedicated staff working in aging services community. My organization represents 5,000 aging services providers, including nursing homes, home health, and everything in between. So we know just how important you are. You know, throughout the pandemic, you and your colleagues have shown again and again what the people working in aging services are all about. You're about care, compassion, lifting spirits, and helping older adults live life to the fullest. 
No matter what role you serve in your organization, you are a part of people's homes and their lives. And the pandemic has made it ever more clear how much like family you are to so many of the people you care for. But tonight isn't about them. Tonight is for you. We're gonna discuss the latest facts on COVID and hear from leading experts on the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines that are available. I hope you'll learn a lot from these speakers. I know I will but also from your peers who will join us to share their own firsthand experience with COVID vaccines. We know that the reasons that people feel hesitant about the vaccine are real and varied. So we're here to help you get the answers you need to make the decision that is best for you, your family, and the people you serve. Achieving a high rate of staff vaccinations will be a game changer for all of us in the aging services community. In fact, my organization has endorsed a goal of 75% of nursing home staff being vaccinated by the end of June. And we're committed to doing all we can to make it happen, including ensuring ready access to everyone who needs and wants a vaccine and through events like tonight's town hall. I'm glad that we're joined here tonight by our partners at the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, the American Healthcare Association, and the National Center for Assisted Living. But most of all, I'm excited that you have decided to join us here tonight. So thanks for being here. And now back to you, Dr. Tuxen. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you mentioned all of the people that the organizations that have joined with us, and there are many, many more. Uh, across this country who have partnered with us and have made it, uh, who have also uh, made it possible for their uh, constituents to know about this show and uh, to join us tonight. To get us started off, I'm very, very pleased to, uh, to begin a conversation on giving us an update on the epidemiology of the COVID uh, virus pandemic, and also to give us some insights on where we are with the vaccine availability. I am particularly pleased that uh, that we have a senior representative now from the White House with us and our friend, Dr. Cameron Webb, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for Equity on the White House COVID-19 response team. I'm also pleased that we are joined by a good friend of, of our programs, and that's Dr. Amanda Cohn. Amanda is the Deputy Director for Immunization Services Division at the CDC. And I'm also very pleased that we are joined tonight by Dr. Michael Wasserman. My, my, uh, Dr. Wasserman is a prominent geriatrician, a member of California's Community Vaccine Advisory Committee, and was a key member of the National Academy's committee on making the decisions for how to allocate the very scarce COVID vaccines. Welcome to all three of you. And let me begin uh, with you, uh, Dr. Webb. Can you give us an update, uh, you and, uh, and, and, and also Amanda, if you could give us an update on where we are with the epidemiology of the pandemic, What's the latest data on hospitalizations and, and deaths? Uh, help us to understand where we are at this moment. I was gonna say, Amanda, do you wanna start with the epidemiology and I can jump in from there? Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, thank you uh, so much. And uh, Reed, thank you for bringing us together to uh, talk to this amazing group of uh, healthcare workers that have been just so important. Uh, always, um, but um, have really just been heroes over the last year. Um, so many of you know, we are fortunately uh, going, uh, we're fortunately past the huge uh, 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 surge in cases that occurred in, uh, in December and January. We were reached over 200,000 cases being reported a day. Uh, and now we're uh, much lower than that. We're about 50,000 cases reported to a day. Uh, we were also reaching at about uh, 4,000, 3,000 deaths on average. And uh, those have also fallen to about 1,000 uh, cases or de deaths a day. What um, is important is that we're still seeing cases and deaths, hospitalizations and deaths, primarily among older adults and adults with high-risk medical conditions. Of the 513,000 deaths where we have age reported, 80% were in adults over 65 years of age. Um, we also know that older adults are at substantially higher risk than younger adults. Uh, so compared to 18 and 29 year olds, uh, adults that are 40 years of age and older are 10 times higher, 
when you get to 65 and older, they're 90 times more likely to die of COVID than um, a young adult. Um, so these are really um, uh, huge differences in risk by age group. And, and many of the people you take care of in a daily basis are the uh, older adults that are at most risk for hospitalization and death. Um, fortunately, we're seeing some light. And um, I would say that I, I, I strongly believe in the next several weeks, we'll start to have evidence that vaccination in um, long-term care facilities uh, is actually having an impact. And we're seeing reduced uh, disease spread in nursing homes compared to uh, before December when we started vaccinating these groups. Uh, there were still we're still looking and collecting all of this data, but um, I think this will be really good news that we'll start to see. Um, but um, we, we still need to ensure high vaccination coverage, especially in the setting of uh, potentially uh, uh, new variants spreading that may not be as effective as these incredibly um, effective vaccines. And uh, so the best way to stop these variants from spreading is to get vaccinated, reduce transmission and outbreaks, and um, continue to do all of the things that we um, are doing both at work and at home um, to uh, stop the spread. Um, Cameron? I, good. Uh, Cameron, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I was just going to add that, you know, if you look at our different, you know, uh, age cohorts, if you're talking about folks who are over 85, uh, when folks get COVID and they're over 85, nearly one in four, unfortunately, pass away. If you're talking about folks between 75 and 85, you're looking at, at about, you know, one in 10 who pass away and between 65 and 75, about one in 20. That's much higher than the rest of the population. So we know the disproportionate impact that COVID has on, on older communities. But I think the key here is making sure that we, we factor in the role of the vaccine in really protecting and, and preventing those deaths. And, you know, I'll just quickly share my, my wife's 97 year old uh, grandmother uh, just uh, just got her vaccine a little while ago. And I think that's that's exciting because knowing the disproportionate value that it has to somebody in that age bracket, it's really, really important. So we're glad at the number of, of our older adults who are getting vaccinated, but I think we just have to keep pushing because we still have plenty left to go. Let me ask both of you, you're not politicians, you're physicians. And so let me ask you, um, uh, the governor of Texas, uh, the governor of Mississippi and another one of our governors have decided to open up their states. Uh, and not even requiring to wear masks. Does that mean the crisis is over? No, the crisis is not over. Uh, and I think you can we can say that pretty plainly. The, the science tells us the crisis isn't over. The data tells us the crisis isn't, isn't over. And in fact, decisions like, you know, removing mask mandates, they have no basis in scientific evidence. And so this is the unfortunate politicization of this pandemic. And, and we know how this plays out. We know that when people aren't wearing masks in public spaces, we see an increase in cases, we see an increase in hospitalizations, and unfortunately, we see an increase in deaths. So that's not good policy. Um, it, it may, for their purposes, you know, appear on its face to look like good politics for now. But if those numbers change, it won't. The key is that we want to keep people alive. We want to keep people out of the hospital. We want to prevent cases of COVID because that's actually the path to, to reopening all of our, our states fully is to crush the virus. And I think you do that by following the public health measures. Dr. Wasserman, you live out in uh, California. Are you worried about what happens in Texas? Oh, absolutely. Um, th th look, there's even with the vaccine, uh, and we know, and, and I, I will also comment, we've seen a precipitous drop in cases and deaths in nursing homes where the residents have been fully vaccinated. But that's moderate to severe disease. We still want to prevent the transmission, and that means wearing masks, washing hands, and just being careful. So to me, uh, you know, the new normal for our society during COVID uh, is until COVID's passed, honestly, is being cautious. And that means wearing masks. So, no, I am, <laughs> when I heard that, it, it scared me because um, there are going to be those older adults who don't get vaccinated. There are going to be those older adults whose immune systems don't respond as well to the vaccine. And we want to take every precaution from in order to reduce the the transmission and spread of, of this deadly virus. 
Terrific. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cohen, uh, someone is asking about your perspective on boosting the immune system and how important uh, is that? And do we feel like uh, with the new va vaccines that we will need to have booster doses uh, as we go through the variants that you describe, you and Dr. Webb describe so well? I think that uh, these vaccines are so exquisitely uh, protective against uh, disease and severe disease and, and death. It's really um, incredible. Uh, that was after a couple of months. Uh, we will certainly see some decline in protection over time. Um, and then we may or may not see um, shifts in protection because of uh, these new variants. But new variants are going to come up all the time. And uh, we need to watch it closely. We need to look at which variants uh, may not be as well protected by the vaccine. And I will tell you, um, and I have just so much confidence that uh, everyone is, the, the number of strains that we're looking at and collecting data on to inform um, if somebody is going to need another booster dose or, uh, you know, companies are already working on having a third dose with the new strains included. Um, this is all happening at lightning speed and really just also in such a, um, uh, just a very high quality way. Um, so uh, I don't know the answer yet, but uh, we will be um, communicating that information as soon as we um, have enough data to, to suggest that somebody needs a booster dose. And Dr. Webb, um, you are right there with the leaders of our government. Um, you, the president uh, has made some pretty strong uh, goals that he set for the nation to get vaccinated by a certain time period. How are we doing? Well, you know, so far we're doing really well. If you, if you look at where the original goals were, you know, being on pace to, to vaccinate 100 million people or 100 million doses in 100 million days, we're, we're ahead of pace uh, to reach that goal. And I think that that's important. When we talk about uh, when doses will be uh, manufactured, we'll have no, enough doses on hand uh, for all adults. Originally, that was July, moved up to May. And so we're, we're kind of uh, you know pushing forward, and in part because of President Biden's leadership, because of the Defense Production Act, because of this you know really huge uh, you know connection between Johnson & Johnson and Merck to help increase the manufacturing. So we're doing a lot of things uh, around the edges to make sure that we're getting enough vaccine that's available to people. Uh, but I think that we're, we're, we say it all the time, we're not going to spike the football until this thing is done. Every step that we take in the, is just a step in the right direction. We are truly in a race against the virus. We're against the variants. We're trying to make sure that, that everybody who is at risk of severe disease, at risk of death, that they're getting vaccinated, we're getting that taken care of as soon as possible. And then we're trying to get the vaccine to everybody in all of our communities. And so um, the, the key here, uh, we talk about speed and you hear us uh, reference, you know, how quickly we're moving along. The, I say it all the time. This doesn't matter at all without equity. If we're not equitably distributing vaccinations, uh, you know, getting vaccines into the communities that are the highest risk and the hardest hit, then we're behind the eight ball all the time. And I love how Dr. Cohn mentioned, uh, you know, how important it is uh, that this is moving quickly. And it is. And she also, I want to really emphasize that it's moving safely. You know, the, the evidence and the scientific rigor that we're putting to everything we're doing, that's really front and center. So when we talk about some of the grounding ideology here, the science is there, equity is there. We're really leaning into doing this the right way. Let me make sure that we deal with the big issue on the table today for so many people, and that's the J&J &J vaccine. And we've heard numbers that some people interpret as suggesting that it may not be as effective as the other two, even though it enjoys the advantage of a single dose and, and, and easier to store because it doesn't require the refrigeration. What do you all say about the quality of that of the new J&J &J vaccine compared to the other two that we already have experience with? I say it works. I say it's a it's a it's a great it's a great vaccine. You know, when we look about what we when we look at what we want in our and want to have in our skill set and our tool belt, I should say, um, the Johnson Johnson vaccine really extends our capacity and virtually a hundred percent of of uh, folks who receive that vaccine, no deaths, no hospitalizations, no severe COVID. That's huge. And so you're talking about a single shot that achieves that level of, of good outcomes. 
that's really fantastic. I think you add on top of that um, kind of the the uh, different way, different from the other two vaccines that it can be used from a storage standpoint and from a dosing regimen, you know, just a single shot. You know, there are people who are going to say, hey, I think a single shot works better for me. And we want them to be able to make that choice. And so I think it, it adds a lot. And we've heard from people just in these two days of people getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that, hey, that, that actually works well for me. And we'll continue to make sure they're hearing good messages on it. But sorry, I jumped in in front of you, Dr. Cohn. No, I was going to say the, the exact same thing. Um, this is, an, the J&J vaccine is another incredible vaccine. It is uh, much more effective than um, flu vaccines. And additionally, I think, you know, we really sh can't compare these vaccines. They were all studied under different circumstances uh, with different strains circulating. And the most important thing to look at is that all three of these vaccines prevent hospitalization, severe disease, and are 100% effective against death. And that is just, um, you know, it's it's phenomenal. Dr. Watson, what are you saying to your patients? No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think for, for folks working in long-term care, in nursing homes, assisted livings, group homes, rural areas, uh, the J&J &J vaccine just adds another opportunity to get folks vaccinated. And, uh, you know, in addition to the residents themselves, we've got to get the staff vaccinated. Um, you know, and again, for those of you who are in aging services, the folks who have been on the front lines caring for these vulnerable, this vulnerable population, you've been putting yourself at risk for a year now. And getting you the vaccine, in my opinion, is the single most important thing we can do. And the J and J vaccine adds another another arrow in our quiver. And I, I think it's a potential game changer in terms of just getting more folks vaccinated and getting us out of this, uh, you know, the, the way we've been for the last year. Outstanding. And I will say that uh, I was privileged to serve with you on the National Academy uh, Committee that made the original allocation decisions for prioritization. And you were a stalwart advocate over and over again that says we have to provide early and easy access to the people who serve in these environments, in the long-term care environments. And I want to applaud you for that. Let me make sure uh, that we are also uh, clear uh, about um, uh, about this important issue here that, that one, of our, uh, uh, one of our members of our audience raised before the meeting started. And that was this. It says that um, we have real challenges in, in getting uh, access uh, to vaccine dissemination in the aging services community. And that older people in nursing homes, assisted living and HUD 202 buildings were rightly prioritized in the pharmacy partnership for long-term care. But after the pharmacies conducted the designated three clinic sessions, these communities seem unsure of what happens next. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I don't mind jumping in. It's been my favorite topic for going on four months. Um, Look, there's no question that the way the, the Federal Pharmacy Partnership was originally put together, it sort of ended after that third visit. And I, I, I'm confident that the, the Biden administration is working hard to make sure that we're continuing to get the vaccine out. And that, that's been, from my perspective, the number one priority that we shouldn't expect the frontline staff and certainly not the residents to have to work to get vaccinated. It should be brought to them. We need to be doing everything in our power to bring the vaccine to the people who have needed it and deserved it the most. And I'll also mention, you know, in addition to folks living in nursing homes and assisted living, you have a lot of vulnerable older adults living at home, uh, cared for by family members, and we really have to work hard to get all these folks and their caregivers actually uh, vaccinated as well. So I, I think we're in a bit of a transition right now, and I, I don't want to put any pressure on, on our other two speakers in terms of where we're at with policy, but, but I'm hopeful that the policy will help guide us in, in the near future. I'll just add, um, it is, you know, I think we all strongly believe, or uh, regardless of policy or implementation, 
if um, someone was offered a vaccine in one of these clinics in December or January and wasn't ready, that should not be the only opportunity they have to get vaccinated. We need to make sure that anybody who uh, changes their mind or wants to get vaccinated, even if they said no the first time, has easy access to vaccine. And I think it it may not, it's, it's not even necessarily gonna be policy that's gonna help us get through this particular transition from the federal pharmacy program to um, where we need to make connections at the local level with these long-term care facilities and the pharmacies that served them so that they will come back and do um, sort of uh, uh, additional efforts or have a place, you know, it can can organize at a more uh, local level uh, to support uh, continued vaccination of staff and and um, residents. We know that there's a lot of turnover, uh, both in residents and staff. So this is an ongoing challenge, um, and we will uh, be working hard uh, to ensure that uh, everyone, uh, even if they weren't vaccinated during one of those three clinics, has access to vaccine. Great. One, somebody else asked us the question that is very interesting. What happens if someone, um, uh, let me see, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, oh yeah, homebound older people are really isolated and so are their caregivers. Let's say for instance, a person with advanced dementia and their family caregiver who were isolated before the pandemic and now it's hard to even imagine how alone they are and must feel. How can we get vaccines to them and to other people who can't get to the clinic or the pharmacy? Well, and, and, you know, I know Dr. Wasserman mentioned this just a second ago. It's not just about uh, having locations for folks to go get vaccinated. We have to get vaccines to people. And I will say, you know, one of the great things looking from the federal perspective is some of the states are leading the way. So we are seeing some states that are making it easier for folks uh, who are at home to, to get access to vaccine, bringing vaccine to those who are kind of shut in it for, for one reason or another. And I think that's going to be important for us to do. Uh, I think what's what's really exciting in terms of the weeks and months to come is that right now we're in this moment of, of real vaccine scarcity. We have, you know, our, our supply isn't enough for our demand and we're seeing week over week that's changing, but we're getting more and more vaccine doses that are readily available every single week. And as we do, we're looking at how can we make sure we're getting these to the people who need it the most. So those are the conversations we're having presently. And like I said, some states uh, across the country have done a really good job of that. And so I think we're looking to those lessons, we're sharing those promising practices, and we're trying to make sure that as more vaccine comes online, we're able to get it to the folks who need it the most. Let me turn to, uh, to Amanda on this. Uh, Dr. Webb, one of the things that I know very well from my own interaction with you and other members of the Biden-Harris team is that you really care about uh, not only what you do at the federal level, but how it coordinates with the state and local level. And that's really a big challenge. So uh, Amanda, you, you, you deal in this area very intensely. What, what can we do to make sure that people at the local level feel like they will have access and that they will have an opportunity to figure out how to access the vaccines when it is their turn. Yeah, I mean, all of public health really happens at the local level. We can um, roll out programs at the federal level as much as we want, but if they're not um, embraced and um, implemented at the local level, then um, you know it's all for naught. So uh, we um, are working through our state uh, immunization partners, as well as actually, this has really shifted and is such an all of government approach. And I know um, many of you probably don't see this quite yet, but it's, it's uh, you we're starting to see like uh, HUD get involved and, um, and other organizations like uh, uh, ACL, which is the uh, Administration for Community Living and the Administration for Children and Families, all of these um, agencies are helping to support these efforts with all of their um, programs uh, uh, getting connected. And one of the most important things that, that we can all do at a federal level and a state level is to support community-based organizations to work with local public health. Local public health is, as, as all of you have been, um, they're just stretched. They're stretched so thin. And um, they really are trying to manage this COVID epidemic at the same time that they're trying to implement vaccine programs. And we know that our community-based and faith-based organizations um, can really help lead the way with these efforts. And um, we are trying to look for novel ways to support those organizations, not only to engage communities and talk to um 
talk to individuals and communities about concerns they have um, and address those, um, but also to you know support vaccine clinics, sites um, in their space. And so I think that it it's not just gonna take all of government, it's gonna take all of society to uh, get this done. And it's not just bringing vaccine to people, it's making sure they are aware that the vaccine is in their community well, and it's signing I, them up in advance. I'll tell you, uh, uh, that's a great point. And we're almost at the end of this segment and moving on, but let me read a question or a comment from Fritz Esker, who says so many vaccine appointments must be scheduled online. How can we help elderly people get vaccinated if they don't have a younger relative to help them navigate online portals and appointment scheduling? And I think your point about community-based organizations is is spot on. But um, Dr. Webb, I think that we really wanna make sure, and I know that the Biden-Harris team, your team really appreciates how frustrating people, how frustrated people are around the country. And I know this is on your mind. Absolutely, and as it's on our mind, as Dr. Cohn said, we are, we are looking at so many different options for how we can uh, lean into those community-based organizations, faith-based organizations to not, and a lot of times people talk about those as kind of the, the educators, folks to share trusted messages uh, to the communities, but also finding ways to make sure that they're able to actually connect people with vaccine. And we're, we're seeing that with some of our federal programs, you know, in our, at our California mass vaccination site, our community vaccination center, uh, faith and community-based organizations were able to reserve spots for folks heading in and, you know, to get vaccinated. And so those are some of the opportunities that are really important to keep in mind. There are lots of different roles and for all organizations, they're raising their hands saying, Hey, we want to help. Um, there's, there's going to certainly be a way uh, to help. And, and the Biden-Harris administration is very committed to making sure that happens. A 20 second answer from you, Amanda, and 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 that is uh, there are people that want to know, is the CDC monitoring the effects uh, after vaccination? Uh, are we looking at long term? Are you doing post-disease surveillance? Absolutely. We are uh, monitoring both the safety of vaccines and uh, long term effectiveness. And uh, this has been um, it is one of the foremost uh, things we're doing. Um, not only do we need to get vaccine in people's arms to them um, and, and have them get vaccinated, but then um, making sure that these vaccines are safe and effective is, is really critical to the overall success. And uh, 20 seconds, Dr. Wasserman, why, what is your last message that you would give to the, to the workers who are doing this work? Why is it so important to, that, to you that they are getting vaccinated? Well, you know, I, I said a few things. One is we need to, we first we need to respect, honor, and value the work you do because uh, it's so important. And, and we need to make sure we do that. And then from your perspective, if you get vaccinated, you're protecting yourself, your coworkers, your family, and the residents you serve. So I, I think we can all help each other here. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Wasserman. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And thank you, uh, Cam Webb. Uh, you got us off to a great start and we appreciate it. Uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. And now so it's much. my uh, pleasure to bring in a panel that will deal with a lot of the questions that we have in the chat and were introduced to us prior, prior has to do with updates on understanding viruses and understanding of the vaccines themselves. And we understand that there are really a lot of interest in this topic. So let me introduce Dr. Donald Alcindor, Dr. Alcindor is the Associate Professor uh, at, for the Center for AIDS and Health Disparities Research Division in Microbiology and Immunology and Physiology, Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Meharry Medical College. He is uh, a really well-distinguished expert in virus uh, illnesses and, under, and in microbiology. He also is a former member of the FDA's Antiviral Drugs Advisory Board, which is particularly relevant to some of the questions we're going to ask today. Secondly, let me introduce Dr. Siham Magoob. Dr. Magoob is the Medical Director for the Center for Infectious Disease Management and Research at the Howard University College of Medicine. Welcome, Siham. And thirdly, we have with us Dr. Lily Immergluck, who is Professor of Microbiology, Biochemistry, and Immunology at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Welcome, Lily. Let me, uh, we're gonna go right through very succinctly a series of, of, of quick hits because there's so many issues that people have. But let me start out with you, uh, Donald. Tell us a little bit, what is a virus? Uh, is it alive? And how does it, what is all this about it mutating? So when we think about a virus, we, we don't say that it's alive 
but we say that it has a replication capacity, meaning that this virus in itself, sitting on a counter, is inert, meaning that it can't do very much. But if that virus gains access to a cell, that virus has the opportunity to reproduce itself or what we call replicate itself. And so when a virus replicates itself in a cell, it can give rise to what we call progeny virus or uh, other viruses. So the viruses multiply. So when we think about a virus, we think about an agent that is basically a parasite in the cell, and that parasite is an obligate parasite, meaning that it totally depends upon the cell for any kind of, of more any kind of other viruses to be generated from it. And so being an obligate parasite and making contact with a living cell, in this case in the body, that expresses a protein that allows the virus to enter a cell, the virus has an opportunity to replicate itself. And it can replicate itself until the cell is dead, or it can replicate itself and leave the cell alive and simply pump out viruses to infect neighboring cells. And if enough cells are usually uh, harmed, either by death or dysfunction, then you will start to have pathophysiology associated with a virus infection, similar to SARS-CoV-2 causing lung disease and so forth. Got it. And so uh, Dr. Magoob, tell us a little bit about, uh, as we carry on that explanation, uh, what is it about a, a virus that allows it to replicate? Is it is it thinking in its mind and saying, oh, uh, I think there's something, uh, some, th some threat to me. Let me change what I am so that I can uh, evade uh, detection. Yes. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Tuxin, for the introduction. It's always a pleasure to be with you in, all, in these town halls. Um, so um, just thinking because I, I work a lot in the HIV, um, uh, uh, HIV clinics and with HIV patients. So the way the analogy I use for my patients in the clinic is that um, the virus, uh, when it's under pressure of a medication, uh, it's, you know, initially it's a wild type virus, meaning that it's, uh, you know, the, the, the virus that we first um, know. And then it tries to evade the system. So I try to make it very simple to my patients. And I say, when you go out in the winter, you wear a coat or it's raining, you also wear a jacket. So you're kind of protecting yourself. So the, the, the virus basically tries to change its shape or change the surface protein so it can evade our immune system. So this is the whole idea of uh, the virus trying to change a new variant. So um, I just try to make it as simple as, as possible. You know, the virus is just trying to evade our immune system. The, the virus is trying to, um, you know, um, try to get a, around our immune system so that it doesn't recognize the virus. And Dr. Emmergluck, as we think about these mutations, is this uh, unusual that we are seeing this? And are, are you particularly concerned uh, as a virologist and an infectious disease expert about these mutations. So, uh, Dr. Texan, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with um, tonight. So, fundamentally, if we think about um, coronaviruses in general, you know, we uh, recognize that even from the human coronaviruses before um, these novel coronaviruses uh, have come into play, that they are mutating. You know, that is a natural process that happens uh, uh, with uh, viruses in general, as mentioned earlier, and also with coronaviruses. So are we surprised? No, I think the attention is focused more on the fact that uh, are the variants that are circulating in the communities um, as we watch them, uh, how quickly are they being the dominant uh, mutations that are occurring? And then how well uh, can our vaccine products that are coming up through the FDA EUA approval process able to address that? And that therein lies the you know question. So to me, fundamentally, it circles back to the issue of how do we reduce the overall burden of virus circulating in our communities we have to do a combination of things so that we can determine the vaccine effectiveness of all these different vaccines that are coming up through the pipeline. We have to continue our mitigation strategies uh, so that overall we can see a lower burden of virus circulating. And uh, Dr. Alcindor, let's move now towards vaccines. And uh, just help us to understand again, what is a vaccine? So when we think about traditional vaccines and we think about what they are, and so if you look at a vaccine in a bottle that's for administration to protect a person, the greatest amount of that vaccine will be water. 
And of course, then you'll have a, a small amount of preservatives like sorbitol. This is to protect the vaccine from becoming contaminated. Then you'll have other kinds of trace uh, materials in it. You'll also have a small amount of a non-infectious component of the infectious agent. In this case, it would be the spike protein of this SARS-2 coronavirus. And then you would basically have uh, an adjuvant in this case. Now, an adjuvant usually is a, a, an aluminum salt, in this case, aluminum hydroxide or aluminum phosphate that is added to the vaccine to basically allow the vaccine to basically be released at a very slow rate so that the immune response is, is, is greater. So an adjuvant, in a sense, will boost the immune response to a particular antigen that's, that's represented in the vaccine. Now, these trace elements are something that many people are concerned about, but the trace elements that you find in a vaccine is found uh, normally at much higher amounts. And so the trace elements that you see in vaccines that people are concerned with in terms of causing uh, allergies and other kinds of uh, diseases, uh, the possibility of autism and so forth, these trace elements are very low in the range of uh, parts per million and parts per billion. Good. Let me be, let's just make sure we uh, just double down on that, uh, Dr. Alcindor, and just comment again. Is, just to make sure that there's no question about it, is there any virus in the vaccine that is given to people? Okay, so I want to talk about <clears throat> the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is composed of a adenovirus that has an encoded spike protein of the SARS-2 coronavirus. This adenovirus is what is referred to as replication defective. When I say replication defective, this SARS-2 corona, uh, this adenovirus cannot give you an infection. It will not give you uh, COVID-19. Imagine, if you will, the spike protein put into a carrier of some sort. The virus acts as a carrier, like a taxi cab and a, and a, and a, a rider inside. The spike protein is the rider, and the adenovirus that's replication defective is the taxi cab. And it's only for delivery and release of the spike protein and the spike protein is then made into a protein inside the cell. And again, this protein is presented to the immune system and the immune system then generates an immune response to that spike protein. So, Adenoviruses are commonly found in people as well. Great, so that's a pretty great. So in other words, we take a common cold virus that yes. is no longer effective to replicate in the body, a normal cold virus that we then insert something into that so that it can get into the body, give the body the instructions, as I understand what you're saying, give the body the instructions for how to recognize that spike protein that we see on the, the virus. Everybody's seen a thousand, thousand pictures of that virus with those little things sticking out, that this, th that this vaccine takes a ride on a, on a non-infective old regular old cold virus gives the information and allows the body to make antibodies against those spike proteins. That's, that's, that's just great. Well, let me ask Dr. Uh, Immergluck, um, there are a lot of people who want to understand the relationship between um, the natural immune system of the body and the vaccine. Why do we need a vaccine if we've already got a good, healthy immune system and we're eating the right foods and we're taking immune uh, uh, enhancing uh uh, nutrients and so forth and so on. Why do we need the vaccine? Well, uh, to me, it is to prevent you from actually getting the infection itself. And as we grow further and further in this pandemic, we're starting to see uh, more complications that we were not observing early on, especially now I'm a pediatrician, so I'm seeing more things are happening in our younger population uh, as a consequence of infection. Vaccines and vaccinations prevent us from entering into that whole uh, uh, situation where we are infected, okay? We're literally giving ourselves the, uh, uh, the ca capacity to protect ourselves from, from getting infected. 
So that that's the value of vaccinations. And I always mention about how, you know, nowadays when I give talks to students uh, about diseases that I saw as a resident, uh, you know, almost, you know, every night I was on call. Nowadays, because we've done an effective job of vaccinating our children, our infants, and through all the way through our adults, these students don't even know what these diseases are except what they read in the textbook. So that's the point of vaccinations. Great. And Dr. Uh, Magoob, uh, um, again, pushing on this issue, um, 520 some thousand people have died uh, from this disease. And I bet you some of those had pretty healthy immune systems. What is the vaccine doing that our natural body's uh, immune system is not doing? Um, great question, Dr. Tuxen, because um, our immune system is great and uh, recognizes foreign bodies, starts producing antibodies, but at one point, our immune system can be overwhelmed. So this is when um, the vaccines come in, you get the vaccine and you just have more protection to produce more antibodies. When you are exposed to the infection, uh, your um, immune system, basically the memory cells, remember these, uh, you know, antigens or viruses that has seen before and starts producing antibodies. So basically, because our immune system has a limit, you know, um, and, and just think about, yes, so we're speaking about healthy people. So healthy people have a great immune system. And at one point, the virus can overwhelm your immune, uh, your, uh, your immunity, but also think about people who are elderly, um, people who are with uh, pre-existing conditions. So these people, immunity is not as good as a healthy person. So you can imagine they, they start with a low immunity and um, their immunity cannot just like, um, uh, it cannot be sustained and they cannot uh, fight the infection. So that's why they need the vaccination. So it's very, very important for people who are elderly and people with pre-existing conditions. Well, Dr. Alcindor, also for the people that are doing the work who may not be elderly, but serving the elderly, uh, is it legitimate or reasonable for someone to say, I'm a healthy person, I am eating a healthy diet, my immune system is going to be just fine, why do I, I don't need to take that vaccine because um, my, my natural body will take care of everything and protect me? I hear that all the time. So I get out and I go into salons, I go into small businesses in Nashville, I go into barbershops and people are telling me I've never taken a flu vaccine why should I take this vaccine? Because I've never had the flu. They can't, uh, they have, they cannot uh, say that with any kind of assurance, because if you have any underlying conditions, you can be young, you can be young and have diabetes. You can be young and have a heart condition. You could be a very young person and have hypertension. And so all of these underlying clinical conditions has nothing to do with being young in a lot of ways. And of course, you could go through something in your life like a transplantation that might uh, force you to use immunosuppressive drugs that would make you even more vulnerable in some cases. And so the condition that you are uh, in terms of age is not a direct relationship in terms of whether you're infected by this virus or not. There are people that are dying of this virus in their 20s, in their 30s, some of them with no underlying conditions. And so what I'm saying to you is that um, to not get this vaccine would be jeopardizing uh, your life in a sense if you were to get this infection and not get uh, medical care and attention, uh, appropriate medical care and attention. And so uh, to say that you're young and my immune system can handle it, there's a lot of people that have been wrong about that and uh, they've gone, they've passed away. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we want to say to those who are taking nutritional supplements and doing things, eating properly, exercising, good, good sleep, keep doing it. But yes. that doesn't mean you don't get the vaccine as well. I actually am someone who has gotten both of my doses. I try to eat well. I uh, do things to boost my immune system. I work out regularly. I do all the things I'm supposed to do, but I, it's, it's the belt and suspenders. I would never risk my life on uh, just on a on a on a on, you know on a on a crapshoot, uh, do do both, and that's really what is very important. Well, we're going to go very quickly here through some things that are important. Which one of you would like to take the issue that is in our chat? How did this vaccine get done so fast, and how can I have confidence in anything that got done this quickly? So I will uh, take that question. 
So it turns out that vaccines that were generated for the HIV virus, and of course there's no good vaccine for the HIV virus yet, but all of the technologies that were developed for other vaccines basically paved the way for them to do this in a much more uh, fast manner. The other thing is that there was a situation where the federal government stepped in and said money will not be an option here. So they gave them $10 billion to a few companies and said, make a vaccine. The charge was to have 300 million doses of a safe and effective vaccine developed by January 1st, 2021. And it turns out some of those companies were able to do that. However, they're not able to have that many doses, but they're able to get EUA authorization. EUA means what? E emergency use authorization by the FDA. And this is not full approval, but it's emergency use authorization. It's emergency approval, so to speak. And so the FDA is looking at everything that comes out of this vaccine rollout. They will follow these patients for safety and efficacy going forward. There are a number of questions that we still have in terms of, will these vaccines prevent transmission? What is the immune duration of these vaccines? How long of immune protection do we have with all of these vaccines and so forth? And one thing they did that was very important to make this happen fast. And again, when money is no object, you have to have something else because the number of phases that an individual company has to go through to get to EUA, they have to have, first of all, they knew what the candidate antigen was. So the NIH was able to get information on the coronavirus spike protein from China very early. And what they did is they ran phase one, phase two together, as opposed to separate. And these are different phases that look at volunteers looking for safety in a vaccine and then efficacy and safety in phase two. And again, in larger numbers. And when you run those together, you save a lot of time. At the same time, they also started producing the vaccine in terms of manufacturing during the first phase of the clinical trial. And so usually a company would never do that because they're not sure that the vaccine will be effective. But again, when money's no object, you, you do it that way. And what it does, it saves you a lot of time. So as soon, uh, in terms of general, uh, in terms of a vaccine being made, it takes about 72 months, and that's a very short time. Otherwise, it takes 10 to 15 years. But again, they were able to do this in about nine months using that strategy and technologies that were pre-existing. And of course, when you run phases together and you start manufacturing very early, what's going to happen if your vaccine is successful? You will get across the finish line at a very quick pace. And another thing I just want to say is that uh, there are a number of critical review uh, points within getting a vaccine to EUA. First of all, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board will examine all of the clinical trial data. Then the FDA Advisory Board will also review that clinical data and give recommendations to the FDA. And once the FDA gives the green light, then indications for that vaccine will go to the CDC Advisory Boards. Great. So let's be really clear here. And uh, first of all, I don't know whether you, uh, Lily or Siham, have any uh, additions you want to make to the speed question at all? Uh, so just I want to add, um, Dr. Tuxton, is uh, I just want to reassure the people, the public, the audience today is that uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, does not cut corners. So there is a very uh, rigorous, extensive review and analysis of any data that comes from a clinical trial. So this is to reassure everyone. And also why, it, uh, you know, um, because we had um, the scientists already knew um, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. So we already knew that um, the, uh, we had um, learned a lot from that, uh, those viruses and the SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to these two viruses. So just to reassure everyone, there is a lot of, um, you know, uh, review and it's, it's, you know, there is no cutting corners. And both of you have, uh, both Dr. Immergluck and Magu, you've done uh, a lot of, uh, at your institutions, uh, of research on these issues. Uh, were um, people of color who are part of uh, this audience, 
want to know, were black scientists and black patients involved in the research? So at our site, um, we had just completed recently the Novavax trial, uh, the phase three, and we have about 60% African Americans in our uh, community and about 10% uh, uh, Latinx uh, community and about 3% uh, Asian. Um, so that's our makeup. I, I tell people I've been humbled uh, by all the stories of the different participants and why they've come to participate in our trials. And an example is uh, actually I shared uh, two nights ago is one of uh, a college professor at Morehouse College, which is walking distance from our medical school. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm a black man and I'm doing this because I want to sh in be an example to say, I have researched this, I trust this, I want to be a part of a trial because I believe in science. And I showed his picture because he was used actually for a BBC uh, photo journal and, uh, and, a, and a talk to 10 medical students I give every uh, six weeks. And they said, hey, that's our professor from, from undergrad. And I said, wow, okay. And anyway, my point is, is that ripple effect is, is really important. Uh, having people in our community step up and share why they're uh, being involved in a clinical trial or taking the vaccination that had been FDA approved for emergency use authorization during a pandemic, it's important. And so we at Morehouse School of Medicine hope that we can be a community, part of the community and serve as a resource of a trusted information. Let me do 10 second answers for some really, really quick questions. Number one, if I have sickle cell disease, should I take the vaccine? Absolutely. Yes. If I have HIV AIDS, should I take the vaccine? Absolutely. Yes. 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 If I have an Im immunocompromising situation, should I take the vaccine? Yes. Yes, you should. If I'm pregnant, do I take the vaccine? Yes. In consultation with your, with your doctor, there is no indication that a pregnancy would be uh, a problem getting the vaccine. Does, does the uh, vaccine make me compromise my fertility? No. I'm sorry? No. Okay, just wanna make sure I heard you right. Does, <laughs> a lot of people interested in that one. Um, right. uh, does the vaccine interfere with my DNA? It does not. No, not at all. All right, and then finally, um, even at the pandemic's worst, it only killed two to three percent of the people who got it. I'll take those odds any day. Why bother with the vaccine? Don't take a chance. Don't it take could, a chance. You could be on <laughs> the other have, side of that two to three percent. Yeah, yeah we, have, we need all. We're, we're still different. learning a lot about this virus and what yeah. it can do and the long-term complications. I, I, yeah. No, don't don't take a chance. We have seen it all, Dr. Tuckson. We have seen healthy people. We have seen people who are really, really sick. And we were just like puzzled how a healthy person would end up in an ICU in a ventilator and die. So don't take a chance. All right. Well, that is it for this panel. I want to thank you all for the science about this. This was terrific. And uh, we will see you uh, next time. Take care. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Bye. Bye. And then to bring in uh, to our discussion uh, Dr. LaShawn McEver. Uh, she's the director of the Office of Minority Health at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And also I'm excited to bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Gloria Wilder. Uh, Dr. Wilder is the president and CEO of Core Health and Wellness Centers and vice president for innovation and health transformation at Centene Corporation, a diversified multinational healthcare enterprise with a strong presence in the Medicaid space. Uh, Dr. McEver, um, tell us a little bit about why CMS is involved in this issue and why you personally wanted so much to speak uh, to this very special audience tonight. So thank you, Dr. Texan, for having me this evening. Um, as you said, I'm the director of the Office of Minority Health at CMS, and we have this is an important issue for our communities that we serve. So our office focuses on underserved communities, meaning racial and ethnic minorities, rural populations, people with limited English proficiency, and people with disabilities. So these are many of the communities our healthcare workers serve and the communities healthcare workers live in as well. Um, at CMS, we care deeply that every American has access to the information that, that will lead them to become vaccine confident and certainly we believe that those who are caring for our elderly population 
many of whom may be older themselves need to be properly protected from COVID-19. There is, where, please finish. Oh, so in addition, I was gonna say accessing information can be a big challenge though for our communities and getting that information can be all the difference in gaining access to what they need. So CMS has been working uh, to be as innovative as possible with our policies to help clinicians and others as they confront COVID-19. Also, CMS has been consistently listening to healthcare workers through open door forums, fireside chats, weekly partner meetings, and our own office has hosted several listening sessions last year and as recently as January. Um, the healthcare workers we've been meeting with represent the, the whole range and spectrum of delivery. And in the most recent session, um, we had a partner that made a comment about the vital role of healthcare, healthcare communities as community members, something I think is important as well. And she said, you know, when a person asks a healthcare provider, so a nurse or a caregiver or office staff or anyone who is a member of their community, are you getting the vaccine? The answer resonates strongly and quickly in their community. So it's essential our healthcare workers trust and accept the vaccine for themselves and for their patients, because this will help ensure the safety of our communities, our healthcare workers and the elderly. Let me follow you up with that question and give you one uh, comment from Catherine Streeter, who says, there is still a lot of distrust or skepticism about the vaccine within the senior living employees. What techniques are most helpful to turn the maybes into yeses? Any ideas uh, from your experience of listening to employees around the country? So that's that's a really important uh, question. Um, you know, there's, there's several things we're currently doing. Um, vaccine acceptance is a personal choice, but patients will trust their own doctor or healthcare provider and listen to their, their advice. So, you know, as healthcare providers, there's an important role that we play. Many patients have questions um, their providers can help answer, such as do they have qualifying health conditions or concerns um, or other questions um, they're most comfortable discussing with a trusted um, provider. But it is important for providers to have all the resources they need. So CMS has been working to help share CDC and HHS information to providers and insurers through many of our dissemination channels. Um, as well, my office has been helping to organize some of these great resources um, on our website um, from, from, as I said, federal resources, and they're translated in multiple languages, and we update them frequently as new information becomes available. We also have a health literacy um, initiative from Coverage to Care, and this offers resources for providers to talk about COVID-19 and staying safe and caring for yourself including how to manage talking about stress and anxiety. Um, you know, in addition, uh, we want to ensure anyone covered by group and individual health plans can get vaccinated at no cost. So uh, healthcare providers and groups delivering shots, um, shots should not charge patients for vaccine administration. And even before COVID-19 vaccine was available, we established Medicare payment rates for vaccine administration and work with the provider community to establish billing codes so providers can bill Medicare immediately when the COVID vaccine became available. So those are some of the things that are, are occurring. Let me turn to you, Dr. Wilder. You are uh, an expert on in wellness centers and you talk to people about their health all the time. Uh, talk to, again, let me just reread again, Catherine's uh, uh, a very important question. She says there's still a lot of distrust or skepticism about the vaccine within senior living employees. What techniques are you finding helpful to be able to turn the maybes into yeses? Yeah, well, let me speak from the um, perspective of a provider who owns two wellness centers in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, I had to have this conversation with my own staff, right? And in the context of my role with um, Centene, um, where we have this, this conversation throughout all of our organizations. The truth about um, this is that the decision to, to take the vaccine is a personal decision. But um, we recognize the importance of, of your senior advisors, right, in healthcare. And usually that's going to be your primary care providers, your, your um, providers who you've had a history with. And we know that there are vulnerable communities, including my community, where um, trust has been a major issue for a long time. 
right? But there have always been the safety net providers who are in those communities ever since the Freedmen's Hospitals, Howard University, um, uh, and, and the advisors who have always uh, kind of stood by uh, um, communities of color and communities who are more vulnerable. I think when we start to have this discussion, it's important uh, for providers to be honest, right, about what we know and what we don't know, right? I'm honest about the fact, like myself, I took the vaccine a week after it was available, right, and um, finished all my doses, and, and I'm happy to say that um, I made sure my mother got her vaccine and every senior that I know got the vaccine. We called every senior that are, that are in our practices to come in and, and get the vaccine. And, and from the standpoint of reaching out to communities, I think it's really important that we continue to have these types of honest dialogues, right? I think this has been a strong night of giving clear information so that people can make their, their decisions. <clears throat> well, I appreciate that from both of you. And I would augment it by uh, also reminding everyone that we are in this, as we heard in the earlier panel, we're in an absolute full out sprint to the finish line here. If we yeah. cannot get uh, to herd immunity, uh, quickly before these viruses continue to mutate and become uh, unreachable by our vaccine supply, we're going to be in serious trouble. We're already at well over half a million people dead, headed towards 600,000. So we really are in a terrible race. And so those of you who are on the fence need to know that we have got to get you over the fence. We have got to get 80% at least of our population immunized as quickly as possible in the midst of a virus that is mutating every day. And so this is so, so very important. I would ask you one, as we start to close out, but Dr. MacGyver, uh, one thing I'm wondering from your regulatory point of view that CMS is all about is um, how do we protect uh, seniors uh, and, and given that our workers are protecting seniors from scams? Are there gonna be people, you know, is it ever appropriate for someone to charge a, an individual or a, or a senior for a vaccine? So, so you, you asked two important questions. One is cost and one um, is how do we protect our seniors, right? So in terms of cost, regardless of your insurance or even if you're uninsured or undocumented, there is no cost to receive the vaccine. So you may be asked for an insurance card if you have one so your insurance can be billed, but no consumer should have any cost. In Medicare, this means that no beneficiary should pay a copay deductible for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, for Medicaid patients, states will pay for the vaccine. Um, but in terms of protecting our seniors, um, again, CMS wants to make sure our Medicare beneficiaries are on alert for scammers trying to steal their Medicare number. Medicare covers the vaccine at no cost to you. So anyone, if anyone asks you for your Medicare number to get early access to the vaccine, you can bet that that's a scam. And so here's what you need to know. One, you can't pay to put your name on a list to get the vaccine. You can't pay to get early access to the vaccine. And we're asking that people please don't share your personal or financial information if someone calls, texts, or emails you promising access to the vaccine for a fee. And we wanna be clear, you should take your red, white, and blue Medicare card with you so your insurance can be billed just like with other services, but there's no cost to you. And we've also heard that some places are charging fees. This should not happen. There should be no money exchanged when um, someone is going to get their vaccine. Thank you very much. And as, as I end with you, Dr. Wilder, what is the one thing that you would like to leave uh, in the minds of, 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 of our audience? And again, uh, these, these really heroic and sheroic people who are doing the important work every day of taking care of people like my 95 year old mother in an assisted living home. What is your last message that you would leave for them? Well, I'd, I'd like to remind us and go back to a question that you had just a little while ago about the, the percentage of deaths. I think somebody mentioned that your risk of death is only two to 3% and, um, and the um, infectious disease and immunology doctors shared that you don't want to be part of that two to three percent. Well, in my family, two people were part of that two to three percent. We are we are a family who lost two family members due to COVID nineteen over the last year. And believe me, when it hits your family or it hits you, right, you're a hundred percent. You're a hundred percent affected. 
And, um, and at Centene, with our um, health plans, with the providers who are in our networks, we're covering one out of every 15 Americans. And we wanna make sure that there is equity in access, which means everybody has a fair opportunity to get the vaccine. We recognize that there are certain communities that are not gonna be reached by, by um, going online and internet, uh, good old fashioned call still works, right? Knocking on doors works, right? Going for home visits and vaccinating uh, people who are isolated in their homes work. But we as a community have to come out and, um, and help each other, right? To get accurate information and to not be afraid to choose the path of life. Right, COVID is, um, is, is no joke. And we've seen the more than 520,000 lives that have been lost. Let's not have another life lost because they just didn't have the information or the access. Thank you so much, Drs. Wilder and McKeever. We really appreciate your joining us today. Appreciate it much. And now for our last panel, before we uh, uh, close out with some of the other questions that we may not have answered in the chats, uh, today, I am very, very pleased uh, to introduce uh, our panel who will give us perspectives from within the aging services uh, uh, industry itself. And uh, our guests are uh, uh, Gregor Hall, medical director of Eliza Bryant Village and executive director of the National Institute for African American Health. We're also joined by Altonia Garrett, vice president for public affairs and strategic partnerships at Capital Caring Health who's also executive director of the Center for Equity, Inclusion and Diversity there. I'm really also pleased that Miles Lee is with us, a life enrichment coordinator at First Hill Senior Living in DC, who is a, a vaccinated worker. And to moderate and, and, and to conduct this conversation, Dr. Melissa Clark, an expert in population health and a co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Uh, Dr. Clark, as you take us through uh, this conversation, I want you to know you have a couple of more minutes than what you uh, uh, would have had. It's okay because we've been answering the questions as we go. And I want you to make note, Dr. Clark, that uh, one of the questions that I will hope your panel will answer comes from, uh, uh, from the questions in the chat, and that is around the issue of mandatory uh, vaccination. That is apparently a theme that several people in the chat have, and hopefully you'll have a chance to address that with your discussion. Well, we will certainly get to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuxin. Uh, we have heard from the scientists, we have heard from the policy experts, and now we actually get to have this wonderful panel from industry insiders who are on the front lines. And I am so happy to be the one moderating this panel. I'm honored. This is of personal import to me because like Dr. Tuxin, my mom, who's 88, lives in an assisted living facility. She got her second vaccine dose today, as did the workers who have been lovingly caring for her. Uh, and they too got vaccinated with their second dose today. So I am really pleased to be able to get some of these questions answered by my wonderful panel that I'm working with tonight. So I'm gonna start off with the first question. Why is it so important that staff in the direct services uh, to seniors get vaccinated? And I'd like to start off with Mr. Lee. Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Well, one thing it's important because they are basically they're the vulnerable people's lifeline. So when you have all these people going around taking care of taking care of people's grandmothers, grandfathers, and everybody's family members, you want them to be safe and vaccinated. So in turn, you know your family is safe and vaccinated. So, I mean, you, you really need it to be because they're the ones taking care. Absolutely, that makes a very, a lot of sense. And so as far as nursing homes and other long care facilities are concerned, you know, we're hearing you had some wonderful points there, but as of January 14th, there were only about 37.7% of people who work there who actually accepted the vaccine. By February 14, fortunately, that had actually climbed to about 54%. Do you think that more acceptance is happening? And if so, why? And I'd like Dr. Hall to take that question. 
Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, acceptance is growing. Uh, um, studies have shown that when people know someone who's who's had the vaccine, they're more apt to get it. And so I was one of the first people to get the vaccine, um, obviously in my family, because I work in a nursing facility. And, and now my brother's had it, my brother-in-law has had it, and people are kind of feeling like since I survived the vaccine, you're able to do it now. And so, um, you know, as we if we get more people in, in in our community getting the vaccine, I think there'll there'll be more acceptance. And I think there were people that sort of held back with the first fact when it first came in. Um, I got mine at the end of December, and they were they were really so this is this is too early. But now they've seen. Now January came, February. There are people who passed and then sort of wished they hadn't. And so that we're still kind of waiting for them to come back for the second pass. And and you know, supply is limited. So I think I think acceptance is definitely growing. Wonderful. And um, for Mr. Lee, um, when you have colleagues um, that you've talked to who might be reluctant in considering to take the vaccine, have there been any messages that you or conversation that conversations that you've had that you felt might have been impactful? I mean, oh, yeah, there's been honestly plenty of conversations. We've been, basically what we've been doing is just one-on-one -on -one conversations and things like that. And a lot of people will try to will basically tell you just straight up what they're afraid of, what they don't know, what they do know about the vaccine. And a lot of it, you just got to listen and lend, give them a lending ear. And once you give them a lending ear and just get back to them and give them the facts of the vaccine, what it does, what it doesn't do, how it can protect you, how it can protect your family, that has helped a lot. And then like, I'm thinking backing off of what uh, what Mr. What he said earlier. When people see you get the shot and they see you're confident in getting the vaccine and that you trust everybody else and that you trust the science, it makes them want to get it too. So that was another big thing in the conversation. Like, oh, you got the vaccine and you're feeling fine. Let me get it too. And that's that's helped out a lot. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. I mean, we've seen vaccine hesitancy go in the African-American community from about 60% down to about 30%. And even in that 30% of people, they're not necessarily saying, I'm never going to get the vaccine. They just want to get their questions answered. So I think that's an excellent point, Mr. Lee. So Ms. Garrett, what is your organization, for example, doing to address this issue among your staff? Thank you. Great question. And just like Mr. Lee just shared, um, educate, educate, educate. We're continually trying to inform our staff um, with uh, the pros and the pros and cons, but it's mostly pros, of course, um, of taking the vaccination, how it protects them, their families, our patients, their families, and the staff that we are in and out of facilities seeing. Um, assisting with the staff to register online, some staff had, had expressed difficulty navigating the system. So we're taking one-on-one -on -one approaches and helping them get registered for the vaccination. Um, also providing sick days and support if they feel they have had um, need a, a down day after the vaccination. Some people have had some tiredness and fatigue after their second doses. And so we have supported them to ensure they can have that time off to recoup after their second dose. So things, things like that. That's an yeah. excellent point. I'm gonna, uh, actually cover that point. And maybe Dr. Hall, maybe you can also speak to the same thing in your organization, especially from the standpoint of that issue of the fact we know that there's side effects to the vaccine um, with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, I think 75% somewhere in there of people get the side effects of the headaches and the chills and the achiness. So for your workers for whom that might be a real issue coming to work, has there been an ability to give people time off? There, there has been. I mean, I, I know a number of facilities that are that are allowing them their employees to have the next day off. And but you know that that's that second dose effect is really almost welcome because that shows that you have immunity. It shows that the first shot actually worked. And and I I actually had COVID in in November and was very sick. And so it's not it's not all just about death. I was short of breath for for eight weeks. Um, you know, climbing a flight of stairs would would wear me out. Uh, the post COVID fatigue was incredible. And so and and your increased risk for heart attack and stroke, increased risk for performing blood clots in your heart and blood clots in your brain, your legs, all those things are, are sort of post-COVID baggage that you get uh, afterward. That's why people are taking aspirin after they get, they, they, they are sick. And so there are people that are still short of breath months 
after that. And so it's not just to avoid dying. Sometimes it's avoid getting COVID and, and being debilitated for an extended period of time. I think you, you make some excellent points there. And even things like brain fog and memory loss, I think we're also seeing some of those nervous system effects, uh, after effects of having COVID. And we're also seeing too, with the side effects from the vaccination, a lot of people saying that it happens on the second shot if you haven't had COVID, but if you have had COVID, it actually may happen more often on the first vaccination. So all that brings us to the question that Dr. Tuxin said from the audience, which I think is burning on everybody's minds. Do you think that the vaccine might be manda mandated um, by, um, by the industry and by individual companies that hire um, workers to care for seniors? And I'll, I'll ask uh, Ms. Garrett that question. I'm not sure of uh, that answer. I, I do think like the flu shot, it, it could um, it could become a, a, a mandate uh, in the future. But I know from my organization and others, we are have not mandated it for our staff. Okay, and what about you, Dr. Hall? What about from your perspective? Well, you know, it's mandates are hard to in, in our country. Mandates are hard to 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 mandate, right? And so we're we're all supposed to have hepatitis B uh, vaccinations in the hospital, and we're supposed to get flu vaccines. But somehow people are able to dodge those mandates pretty pretty effectively. Um, you know, some show some studies show there's a significant number of people who aren't vaccinated that are sort of supposed supposed to be vaccinated. So uh, I I don't I think. No one really wants to mandate anything, but at the same token, we also have an obligation to protect the, our patients and our, our residents. And so we're hoping that people will just kind of do the right do the right thing in terms of if you're going to work in healthcare, you don't you don't want to be the person that comes in and brings something into a facility and and sort of as the typhoid Mary in your in your nursing home. You don't want to be that, you, and you don't you don't want anyone's death on your on your hands. And then so um, by by you know not getting vaccinated, if you do get vaccinated, you at least know you did everything you could. I mean, once you've determined that it's safe, I mean, so I think this you know getting all the information that you have. If if you knew what I knew, having had it and also having been vaccinated, you'd get vaccinated because there's a lot of unknowns. But the things that we do know. Is, is far enough information to, to really make you want to think you should get vaccinated. It makes perfect sense. And I also want to ask Mr. Lee about that question too. What is your sense from, from your sense and talking with your colleagues about how that might be received if the COVID-19 vaccine was manda mandated um, where you work? Honestly, just in general, from what I've heard from people, probably not the best thing. We as human beings, we like to have a choice. So like, all we want to try to do is educate, empathize, and just try to lead people to make uh, at least what they think is the right decision for themselves and others. Because nobody wants to, people don't like being forced to uh, do things. And like Mr. Hall said, even if they're forced, you know, somebody might just find a way to get around it and still not get it. So we, you know, people you just kind of have to let them make their own choices and just educate them on the topic. All right. Because at the end of the day, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's their body. Yeah, you make some good points, I think, um, though, that with any mandate, they're always, uh, as Dr. Hall said, they're always reasons, legitimate reasons, why people might not be eligible to fall under the mandate. So I think there are always reasons to, um, you know, not necessarily have to um, abide by mandate if it might be harmful for you. Um, so, you know, there are some audience questions that I think we can get to. And one of them is, if only 70% of us have to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity, what do you say to people who say, I'll be in the 30% and still get the advantage of the immunity, right? Um, I'll, I'll put that to uh, Dr. Hall. How, how would you answer that? Well, I mean, I, and it's that a lot of people are taking that view. And I think so. As an African American that lives in an African American community, I, um, if if all of the people sort of around me decide to do that, we might, as a country, have seventy percent or eighty percent herd immunity. But in my circle of, I'm visiting my friends and my family who are predominantly African American. I'm going to be in a circle that that doesn't have herd immunity, frankly. That 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 has because because 
this African Americans are disproportionately sort of making the choice not to get that, uh, and which is why we're we're trying to educate people right now. And so you may have this uh, countrywide or citywide herd immunity amongst a whole lot of people, but in our community, it's going to be lower. It's not we're not going to be at herd immunity, and you never know when you go over someone's house that you might be in a, in a, a house full of people who who made the same choice as you, and if one of them sick. Now you're you're going down a, a bad path, and so you you never know what 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 herd immunity means as it relates to your circle of influence. Yeah, well, that that makes perfect sense, and I would imagine if we're, we're thinking about the bubbles within a long-term care community, that becomes even more important. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Garrett, if another question from the audience is, if I have to keep doing everything the same, masking, social distancing, hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. Why should I bother to get the shot? It's a great question. And um, just echoing what the doctor just shared, it's it's the, it's the right thing to do for the greater good of the community, um, as, us as a collective, the facility, the patients, the families that you're encountering. And it's the science proves that it's the best method to um, move forward with the vac vaccination. So they um, need to continue to do the right thing for the greater good of the community to protect their patients, the families, the staff, as well as their own families, um, is what I would say. And, and, and Dr. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, it's, it's, it's like when we do anything, we have, we have C. diff in a nursing facility, right? Then what do you have to do? You have to take extra precautions. You have to, you have to do Think because you know that that an infection is imminent and, and and the spread of it is imminent. So when you're in a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, guess what? The infection is imminent. The spread is imminent. So now the rates are going down in, 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 in where I am in Northeast Ohio and in a lot of states. And so when it gets down to the point where we're not in a pandemic again, that's when you, know, you can take the mask off and that's when things are going to start to drop. But you want to do that based on based on information and based on community, you know, what's the data in your community? Who has it and who doesn't, you know? So there may be outbreaks, uh, just like there are outbreaks of other things in, in, in your facility that you you may mask up again, because you see what it's done. All this masking and hand washing has almost eliminated the flu season this last year. And so that, you know, you it may come back in little bits, especially if we have a, we're in a community where people did, didn't get the vaccine, um, but, you know, hopefully if we can get herd immunity where the infections can stop spreading, then we can kind of go back to normal. Great. Well, Dr. Clark, I think we'll have to leave it there. You've done a great job with our panel. I'd like you to stay, Dr. Clark, for a few minutes and bring back some of our other uh, guests for a quick lightning round of questions that we didn't get to uh, yet. But thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Altonia Garrett. And thank you, uh, Miles Lee. There were a lot of people cheering you on, my brother. Um, and so uh, good on you and keep, uh, keep spreading the word and not Thank the you. virus. Thank you so much, panelists. Great. And uh, now for the rapid uh, cycle uh, question round, um, if we still have Drs. Uh, Immergluck and uh, uh, Alcindor and Magoob, uh, that'll be great. But uh, Dr. Clark, let me quickly go to you uh, with the first question that I know you know uh, a lot about. Can the virus, excuse me, can the vaccine affect our fertility? Absolutely uh, not, based on the information that we have to date. So we know that within the Pfizer and Moderna study, there were 23 women who actually got pregnant um, and have not had ill effects from participating in the study. Um, that data is still being collected. There are about 15,000 pregnant women to date who have received the vaccine and we are waiting data uh, around um, vaccines in those COVID vaccines in that cohort of pregnant women. To date, we have seen absolutely no effect on fertility. And what about breastfeeding, by the way, also, Dr. Clark? Uh, can a woman who's breastfeeding get vaccinated? Yes, there's um, actually uh, encouragement by the uh, ACOG, which is the specialty, specialty society, sorry for OBGYNs, who recommend that women who are breastfeeding uh, get pregnant. And one other thing I just wanted to add, one of the concerns of that circulating myth about it affecting fertility is the concern that because it is the genetic material of the 
uh, virus that is included in the vaccine, that somehow that's gonna get into your cells and affect your own DNA. Number one, we are constantly bombarded by the, the genetic material of viruses. Every time we get a cold and a flu, that has not affected our fertility. And secondly, the, the genetic material in the vaccine, once it gets into our body, it immediately gets destroyed within minutes. Um, after it after it does what it's supposed to do, which is to help make the spike protein in the body for the immune system to respond to. So again, uh, no evidence that it affects fertility. Great, Dr. Alcindor, um, do we have any information available to us now from the science that tells us how long is the immunity that the vaccine will in, will in, infer? So the immune duration that they've been seeing is anywhere from as little as six months to one year. And there's, uh, I don't know if you recall, uh, Tom Hanks' wife who got one of the early vaccinations, her immunity in terms of neutralizing antibodies specific for SARS-CoV-2 was only 11 months, meaning that she could not find neutralizing antibodies to the virus after 11 months from the infection day that she had. So being infected 11 months later, and again, no antibodies. Now, this will vary from person to person, meaning that if you're sitting there and you're 75 years old, your immune response is not like somebody that's 30. And so the idea is that they do see a good immune response in the older individuals that were part of the trial. But again, you don't expect the immune response to be as potent as a person that's much younger. There are um, a bunch of questions, Dr. Clark and uh, Dr. Alcindor, around trying to understand what the vaccine is doing. And, and people are trying to understand, does the vaccine prevent transmission or does it provide the protection from serious illness or death? And they're trying to get a sense of, if I get vaccinated, why do I have to still wear my mask? So the vaccine provides protection against serious illness and death very effectively. We are still studying to understand how much, how much it might protect us from spreading the virus. So we might still get the virus, but we don't get sick from it, but we could still spread it. That data is still being collected. And until we have a clear understanding of that, everyone is still being asked, even if you're vaccinated, to wear your mask to and to continue to distance when you're in public and when you're around people whose vaccination status you don't know. If you're with people who are vaccinated, like you, fully vaccinated, it is okay. Great. And uh, Dr. Alcindor, um, there are questions in the chat around um, side effects. Um, how do we come to understand uh, what, the, what these side effects are and, and how significant are they? So when we think about the side effects for these vaccines, uh, it's, it's minimal. You, you would expect that the side effects would be similar to the side effects you would see with influenza vaccine. And when you think about it, you're looking at one in 100,000 people that might have some type of an allergic response uh, to these vaccines. And again, uh, minimal in terms of people having life-threatening uh, responses. However, it, it does happen and it's usually in the form of pro, uh, anaphylaxis. And of course, uh, many of these often have not been able to be tied directly to the vaccine. And so again, uh, any kind of death associated with the vaccine should be uh, investigated to find out if there's a direct link between death and uh, the vaccine administration. Great, well, we're about to wrap up our show. I wanna just emphasize again to, uh, to everyone that this is an extremely important and serious moment in the history of this country. Uh, it is painful to realize 500,000 and more deaths, and we're headed towards 600,000 in a hurry. Uh, we hope and pray uh, that, uh, that, that, the, that, the, that the decrease in infectious rates and the decrease in hospitalizations will hold up but I think we have a lot of worry about the speed with which the variants are, are moving through. Uh, we need to have this country vaccinated. And we understand that being vaccinated is a personal decision. It is a very important personal decision. I was very impressed with uh, Miles's comment 
that one reason why we need you to be vaccinated is so you will be able to be around to take care of your patients because your patients need you. Uh, this is a very pivotal time. This vaccines that we have, we have three of them. The, all three of them are very effective, unusually effective, uh, in that they are doing just what we would want at a rate that was almost unimaginable to prevent us from becoming seriously ill or dying. The J&J &J vaccine, extraordinary numbers, 85% in being able to prevent serious illness and 100% in death. Same with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. They've already shown us their effectiveness. Across the world, across this country now, 80 million people already vaccinated with one dose or another. So we've got a lot of experience to learn that we know. And we're not seeing uh, the dire concerns that many people expressed uh, before. And so that becomes extremely important for us uh, to understand. We are not uh, early in the stage. We are in the middle of the stage of having experience with this. And we've already learned that these vaccines are not only extremely effective, but they are safe. We thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you need more information or you want to review this show again, it will be uh, archived on blackdoctor.org. That's blackdoctor.org. I want to thank our colleagues at Leading Age. They have been terrific to work with. I want to thank the Centene Company for their generous educational grant. And we want to thank all of our presenters today. But most important, on behalf of all of our society, I would like to say thank you to, the, to you, each and every one of you who have dedicated your lives to taking care of those who need you. Dr. And, Tuxin? Yes. I would like to make a parting comment. You may certainly do that now. Okay. For those uh, communities that refuse this vaccine, over time, they could be a reservoir for infection, for this pandemic to continue, for these variants to continue to develop. And the other, the other point I wanted to make is that we live in a global community, meaning that there has to be vaccine equity across global lines, meaning that you have a situation where there are 100 million citizens in Canada and they have 300 million doses of the vaccine and you have 220 million people in Nigeria and they don't have any vaccine. This has to change. We live in a global community and we know these viruses can travel by transit, travel and commerce. And so we need to vaccinate the global community. Well, that is a very important ethical uh, statement and one that I'm glad you, uh, you, you uh, made sure that we heard. So on that note of ethics and reminding us of the ethics of all of us getting our vaccine so that we can get to this herd immunity and get out of this pandemic so we can open up our society again so that our kids uh, can come visit uh, their grandparents uh, in whatever living situation they find them in, we have got to get out of this, the middle of the stream and get to the other side. And the only way we can do it is if we can get enough people vaccinated in enough time. Have a good evening, everyone. And thanks again for the work you do. Our country owes you a great debt of gratitude. Bye-bye. Thank you.